So this is the first time we're doing it in person, so it's really exciting. And as a church that is in the Reformed tradition, uh, it's always a privilege for us to remember the Reformation. And um, a lot of churches don't do this. Um, for a lot of churches, the Reformation is just something that has happened, and uh, they, no, they don't even remember it. Uh, but of course, in our tradition, we remember this every year. Um, every year um, on the 31st of October um, is Reformation Day and we take time to recall um, the Reformation that happened 500 years ago and what God has done for the church. Um, anyone know, before we get into our lecture, let me just ask, anyone know who wrote the hymn that we just sang? Luther. Yes, Luther, right? And. Um, Luther was sort of the man who started it all, but of course, even before Luther, there were many forerunners of the Reformation. Um, but Luther is perhaps the most well-known reformer uh, for our time. Um, but then there's another man, and that is John Knox. Um, and that's who we're gonna consider today. And um, so let's get into it. And uh, what we'll do is after the sort of lecture, it's, it's more of a story, really. It's the life of John Knox which I'm gonna sort of um, go through. And after that, we'll have a small time of Q&A um, if you have any questions. Um, and then we'll have some games, which Kevin has, um, with gifts, uh, prizes rather, sorry, not gifts, prizes. There will be winners, there will be losers, and there will be, yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> there will be winners and there will be losers. <laughs> um, so we have that, and then we will have um, dinner, right? So stay back for that. But anyway, um, let's begin our lecture today. Um, John Knox, how many of you guys here know John Knox or heard of his name? Any? Okay, good. Maybe I should ask who has not heard of it. So we're all familiar with who John Knox at least is at a very basic level, right? Um, the Presbyterian minister, Ian Murray, um, he wrote that there is no grander figure in the entire history of the Reformation in Scotland than of John Knox. Church historian Ronald uh, Bannington compared Knox to the prophet Elijah. Um, Philip Schaff, who is the German Lutheran theologian church historian, he wrote that Knox has acquired a name which next to those of Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin is the greatest in the history of the Protestant Reformation. And John Knox laid the foundation of what we consider today and take for granted as Western thought and modern civilization. Yet, despite all these high praises that I just read out today, perhaps in all of history, no other reformer has been as vilified, as reviled, and as misunderstood as John Knox. Even in his own life, John Knox was a very divisive figure who was denounced by kings, queens, bishops, councils. He was ridiculed, his effigy was burned in Edinburgh, assassins pursued him, and a century after his death, Knox was publicly condemned by the English Parliament. And today he is hardly known in the secular world. Unlike Martin Luther and John Calvin, even if the world outside doesn't agree with them, it recognizes these men were great men who contributed greatly. However, Knox is largely forgotten. And those who do know of John Knox they regard him as a vulgar, mean-spirited man who hated women. So today, Knox is generally in the world is portrayed as a mad, raving, religious fanatic. So why are we doing this? My task today is not to defend John Knox. That's not where we are. Neither is it to praise John Knox. I think his life will do that sufficiently, so I'm not going to do that. But rather, it is for my task today is to present the life of this saint of God who anchored himself to Jesus Christ, and in doing so, he transformed the kingdom of Scotland with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so today, what I hope that you will come to see is that you will come to learn about the inspirational life of John Knox, of this man who has largely been forgotten, but more important than that, that you learn from him those things which are beneficial for your life, things that are beneficial for your walk with the Lord Jesus. Now. The entire reason we do things like this is because scripture actually commands it. A lot of people say, wait, you're not using the Bible. Why are we wasting time reflecting on some saint of old? Well, because in Hebrews 13, 7, we read, remember your leaders, 
those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their lives and imitate their fate. And so men and women, saints of God, even though we may be mired with sin, doubt and failures, our lives nevertheless reflect, even though imperfectly, it reflects the glory of God. And so that's what we're going to see today. We're going to try to see the sweet beauty of God, whom, they, whom John not served, and how his life testifies ultimately to the grace of Jesus. Right? And so let us consider John Knox, the weak man who feared no man. Um, hardly anything is known about John Knox's early life. He was born around 1514, we're not even sure when he was born, and he was born to a very simple family. Um, and uh, Knox was about four years younger than Calvin. And there's nothing in the life of this ordinary boy that would, anybody would guess looking at him, that one day he would stand before kings and queens preaching the gospel, that one day he would influence parliament and he would bring forth a reformation that would transform an entire nation. During the 16th century, that is the time of the reformation, the 1500s, the Catholic Church held immense power and riches. Um, a third of the land in the United Kingdom was held by the Catholic Church. So therefore, if you wanted to have a good, comfortable career, where do you go to? Well, the biggest multinational institution was the Catholic Church. So you went into the priesthood. And that's what John Knox did. He pursued the path to priesthood. So he studied university. However, he never finished his degree. Um, but, and Knox was not particularly like Calvin or Luther. Uh, Luther was a doctor of theology. Um, Knox, unlike them, was not known for his scholastic capabilities. He was known as a preacher, uh, but not nearly for his academic credentials. When he was 25 years old, he was ordained to the Catholic priesthood in the city of Edinburgh. Um, he was made a minister of the sacred altar in the Diocese of St. Andrews. And he also became, became a notary. Um, he studied uh, canon law, which enabled him to become a lawyer, and he helped draft contracts for nobility. And um, by 30 years of age, John Knox had a very comfortable job. Um, he had a very comfortable job. He had nobles as clients, and he was doing pretty well. He was a loyal knight of the Pope, as he would later say. And it was around this time, around 30 years of age, that things changed. Knox converted to, uh, converted to Protestantism. Now, the details of his conversion are unknown to us. Um, but it is likely his reading of John 17. And can someone tell me what John 17 is all about? I yeah, the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ, where he prays for the saints, where he prays for the church. And it was <coughs> reading this uh, prayer that Knox said that he came to understand that he was a sinner. And it was only through Jesus' work on the cross, Jesus as the high priest who offers himself his body as a sacrifice and it is only through that that he could have come and have communion and fellowship with a righteous God. So Knox came to a very firm understanding that salvation is not by good works but it is rather what Jesus has done on for him on his behalf. So the Catholic Church at this time said salvation was by good works. You could do penance, in fact you could buy indulgences and you could by pardon. But ultimately, Knox came to understanding, well, no, no, nothing to do with it. There's no human work that's going to bring salvation from our sins, but it must be the act of God. And God does this in the person of Jesus Christ. So salvation is by grace alone. And so Knox cast this anchor upon Jesus Christ. Excuse me. Now, Knox having converted to Protestantism, um, or converted to Christianity for the first time, we should say, um, he quietly abandoned his priesthood, and he rejected Roman Catholicism. Um, he took a job tutoring the two sons of a Scottish nobleman who had also embraced the Reformed principles. And, but however, the Reformation by now was very much strong in Germany. It was, all, it was happening in Switzerland, it was happening in Netherlands, um, many states and principalities were being transformed by the gospel, but it was almost non-existent in Scotland. In fact, in Scotland, it was completely outlawed. 
And it was at this time a man named George Wishart. Anyone know who George Wishart is? Heard of his name? Okay, good. That means we're learning new stuff, which is good. <laughs> so a man named George Wishart started to publicly proclaim the gospel in Scotland. <coughs> and a large amount of people started to attend this preaching. Uh, in 1545, Knox heard him for the first time, and he was captivated by the preaching of this man, who, the grace that he boldly proclaimed. And he immediately became a disciple of Master Wishart, as Knox himself says. So what did he do? He enrolled him in his, in his service, he created an office for himself, and he became his bodyguard. And so Knox went, he furnished himself a two-handed broadsword, you know, the William Wallace sword. <laughs> so he furnished himself that, and he made sure that he was always by Master Wishart's side whenever he spoke. Wishart, however, made many enemies in the Catholic Church for his open preaching of something we take for granted today, the gospel, the gospel of grace. And one of these enemies was the powerful Cardinal David Beaton. And David Beaton took personal offense Beaton was an immoral man who abused his privileges and his position for personal gain. Catholic priests, then and now, are supposed to be celibate. Cardinal Beaton was publicly known for his numerous mistresses and having fathered some seven children. He was rich, he was immoral, uh, he was sexually promiscuous, and he vowed to stamp out what he considered the heresy of the Reformation and he persecuted any true followers of the gospel. Unable to bear Wishart's popularity and his influence upon the common people of Scotland, Beaton ordered him arrested under false charges. On the night of his arrest, knowing that his end was imminent, Wishart called his faithful disciple John Knox to his side, and they spoke to him, and then he had him hand over his sword to him. He then dismissed Knox with a blessing, saying, one is sufficient for a sacrifice. And by dismissing him that night, he actually saved John Knox's life. Because that very moment, soon after that Knox left, Wishart was arrested. And he was quickly tried, condemned, and burned at stake. The whole of Scotland heard the news, and they were shocked. Even loyal Catholics were shocked at the what had happened. Because they had sympathies for Wishart. They regarded him as an honest man, as a good and righteous man, while the Cardinal's wickedness and his corruption was well known. And the martyrdom of this saint stirred the spirits of the Scottish people. John Knox was particularly moved and he began teaching, still in private, the gospel of Jesus Christ with his master, Wishart, had preached openly. Knox was gifted with oration and he held his private audience captive as he denounced sin and exhorted them to flee to salvation in Jesus Christ alone. In 1846, Scotland now was finally aflame with the ideas of the Reformation. And several Scottish noblemen sneaked into St. Andrew's Castle, the home of Cardinal Beaton. They waited for his mistress to leave the bedchambers, and once she left, they burst into the bedroom with their swords drawn. Beaton resisted them, crying out, I am a priest! You will not slay me. To this one nobleman called him, No, you are an obstinate enemy against Jesus Christ. Repent. And when he failed to do so, he ran him through, ran him through with his sword. The young men who had stormed the castle then seized the castle and they secured it themselves. And they attempted to negotiate with the Queen of Scotland, who was a Catholic queen, Mary Geese. This is the first of many Marys. We will hear many, many Marys, so it's really confusing. So this is the first Mary, Mary Geese. However, she was furious and she would not negotiate. Instead, what she did was she wrote to France, the kingdom of France. Now, France was a Catholic nation. So she wrote to them for help against these men who had now captured the castle. John Knox openly celebrated the death of Beaton as God's just judgment. And he went and joined the men in the castle. And Queen Mary's army besieged the castle from the outside. But the men inside, they went about their day just normally. Every day they met at the chapel to hear God's word proclaimed. The men begged John Knox to be their pastor. They begged them to bring to them God's word because they knew of his giftedness and his commitment to the gospel. 
However, Knox declined it vehemently. In one of, his, one of the services during the sermon, the preacher, he looked directly at John Knox and he said, In the name of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, and in the name of those that presently calls you by my mouth, I charge you that you refuse not this holy vocation, but as you tender the glory of God, the increase of Christ's kingdom, and the edification of your brethren, take upon you the public office and charge of preaching, even as you look to avoid God's heavy displeasure and desire that he shall multiply his graces with you. Imagine, you're sitting in service, listening to God's word, and the preacher looks at you, points at you, and says, you need to take up this charge. That's what happened to Knox. What do you expect Knox to do? Well, I tell you what he did. He burst into tears right there, and he ran from the church and hid in his bedroom like a little boy for the next few days. He was filled with grief and trouble for days. Knox considered himself utterly unworthy to be a preacher of Jesus Christ. And furthermore, he knew that to become a Protestant preacher in a Catholic kingdom meant you were signing your death certificate. It was outlawed, and he very well knew that if he took this call, he could very well follow the same footsteps of his master, George Bishop. However, he finally accepted the call after much prayer and struggle, and he delivered his first official sermon from Daniel 7, 24 to 25. He would later remark on his answering the call saying, I dare not cast off that burden that God has laid upon me to preach. And so the man who had once entered a church for personal gain and had made vows of loyalty to the Pope now proclaimed the truth of God as a Protestant preacher for the glory of God alone. Knox was a firebrand preacher who spoke simply but with great clarity and great passion. And he daily exhorted the men in the castle with the truths of scripture and commended them to the grace of Jesus Christ. Knox, the French, find, answered Queen Mary's call for help and they sent one of their big gunships. And the gunship from the, um, from the sea, it bombarded the castle relentlessly with its huge cannons. Completely outgunned and outnumbered, the young men surrounded on the sea by the French and on the land by Queen Mary's army, they surrendered. And they were all shipped off, shipped off to France as prisoners of war. Knox would spend the next 19 months as a slave on board a French galley chained to the wall. So look at his career progression. So he became a priest, a Catholic priest, then he became a lawyer, and then he became, he got converted to the Protestant cause, and then he took a job as a tutor, then he became a Protestant preacher for a while, and now he's a slave on aboard a French galley. And he was treated harshly as a heretic. And this tells you everything you need to know what kind of man Knox is. Once, he was made to kiss an idol of Mother Mary. Knox took the idol and he flung it into the sea. And he said, let our lady save herself now. She is light enough. Let her learn to swim. Such was the daring conviction of Knox even under captivity. He would tolerate no idolatry. As a galley slave, Knox was subjected to extreme hardship. And throughout the rest of his life, Knox would never recover from the 19 months of torment that his body underwent. The remainder of his life, he would suffer ailments in his body and he would never, ever overcome the trauma. One time, Knox was so sick in the ship that people were convinced, his friends, the other slaves, were convinced he's gonna die. And so one of his friends, James Balfour, asked Knox if he knew where they were. Knox, seeing the ice steeple of St. Andrew's Kirk uh, in the horizon, he replied, I see the steeple of that place where God first opened my mouth in public to his glory. And I know, no matter how weak I am now, I shall not die until I shall glorify his godly name in the same place. That was the fate of this man, right? He's almost close to death's door at this time. He is a prisoner, he's a, he's a slave in the ship, and he's been there for many months now, and still he thinks that he will be freed and he'll go and preach in St. Andrew's. Uh, church once more and that shows a tremendous 
faith that he has in God and on God's sovereign purposes in his life. And soon after this, um, England had a great, uh, King Henry died, King Henry VIII, who started the Anglican Church, broke away from the Catholic Church, and uh, the Protestant boy king, King Edward VI, came to power. And a prisoner exchange was arranged. Knox and his friends were all released. In England, the Reformation was now truly underway. Uh, Edward VI was a godly young king, um, and he was led by many godly reformers. One of them was Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. And Thomas Cranmer was personally involved in the release of Knox. Um, many of the prayers, um, if you remember this Sunday when we did the Lord's Supper, uh, the prayer of humble access, that's Thomas Cranmer. Um, so Bishop Cranmer had him released. Now, Knox spent considerable time recovering his strength because that was how bad he was. And he was appointed as royal chaplain. And now he had a chance to preach at St. George's Chapel in Windsor Castle before the king. The people were so impressed that he was immediately offered a uh, pastorate of All Hallows, a very prestigious congregation in London. Knox declined. He was then offered to be the Bishop of Rochester in the Church of England. What do you think Knox did? He declined. For Knox, the office of a bishop as someone above all others in the church was just completely unbiblical and he would have nothing to do with it. However, this made men like Thomas Cranmer, who went great lengths to help Knox, think that he was just being ungrateful and incapable of being pleased. And Cranmer was absolutely right. Knox refused to be pleased with anything less than the word, what the Word of God said, including what it said on matters of church governance. And the reason I'm saying this is because you would see Knox being very instrumental in determining a church government that um, we follow till today. For Knox, there can be no compromise. Knox also at this time, as a royal chaplain, started attacking the Anglican celebration of the Lord's Supper, where men and women would kneel at the altar. He said this was nothing but idolatry that is left over from the Roman Catholic time, where you would come and venerate the elements. The English reformers were completely embarrassed by Knox. They had brought him to London and they had given him all these privileges and here was this man going against everything that they are putting up. He, um, he Knox refused every one of their offers and his open preaching that the Anglican liturgy and rites and their ceremonies and all that stuff were human inventions and should be discarded completely embarrassing. So they sent him far away from London to a small parish on Berwick on Tweed. Knox happily moved. Uh, from the glamour and prestige of the royal court in London to the small town. Douglas Bond, who wrote a uh, uh, biography on him, comments on this move. Such a downward career move was roughly equivalent to moving from the position of a CEO of a bank to an entry-level bean counter. So that was like the backwater that he was moved to. But Knox didn't mind, as he would famously later say, I sought neither preeminence, glory, nor riches. My honor was that Jesus Christ should reign. And Jesus Christ reigns wherever the gospel is preached. And so he became a small time pastor in a small congregation in a small town. But this time, this season was one of immense blessing to Knox. As he preached passionately over here, two daughters of the governor of Nor Norham Castle, Elizabeth and Marjorie Boas, were converted. Marjorie Bowles would and Knox would fall in love with each other and they became engaged in 1552. Now Marjorie Bowles' father is the governor of the castle. They're nobility. Knox, he's a simple man. He comes from nothing. So the father, Marjorie's father, immediately disapproved of the match as undesirable so Knox was not a noble man. And even though clerical marriages had now been made legal, which means pastors could marry in England and have been legal for four years. It was still scandalous back then for pastors to be married. No one thought pastors could be married. Uh, many conservative Catholics and Protestants alike viewed uh, married pastors with suspicion, often alleging men converted to Protestantism just so they could marry. And Protestant pastors' wives were treated with scant respect and they were often called the priest's or. However, Knox and Marjorie truly loved each other, and she stood against all that her father and her uncles and her entire family put against her. And they were eventually married in 1553. 
Her father never forgave what Marjorie did. And as a result, she was struck out from his will and she lost everything. Nevertheless, Marjorie was perfectly happy for Fritti found in Knox of everything she needed and was a precious help me to her. But in the same year, King Edward VI died and Mary Tudor, this is the second Mary. Mary Tudor, um, the Catholic daughter of King Henry VIII, became queen as Queen Mary I of England. And oh, wow. Queen Mary was a devout Catholic. Perhaps she was the most devout uh, Marys we're gonna see today. And during her reign, she began a vicious persecution of the Protestants that we now know as a Marian persecution. And it was her, during her reign that the three reformed Anglican bishops, Hugh Blackmere, um, Nicholas Ridley and Thomas Cranmer were all burnt at stake. During Mary's reign, some 280 Protestants would die, many of them Knox's close friends. Mary rightly came to earn the name Bloody Mary. If you, that's where that comes from. Knox fled for his life from England to Europe as a penniless fugitive. He even had to leave um, Marjorie behind. He arrived in Geneva, I guess we met in Geneva, Calvin, exactly, John Calvin. And Calvin welcomed him warmly. However, these were also the darkest days for Knox, for he was away from Marjorie, and he saw England and Scotland, where the fires of Reformation were lit, now again descending into the darkness of the Catholic rule. Knox accepted a call from an English-speaking church in Frankfurt, uh, which Calvin arranged, and there he became a pastor. At Frankfurt, Knox's congregation consisted of devout Anglicans. And by now, if you have realized something, John Knox and Anglicans don't get along. John Knox and Catholics don't get along, right? But now there were Anglicans, which he just considered were a lighter version of Catholics. And these Anglicans insisted upon the Book of Common Prayer, the Anglican form of worship, with its elaborate rituals and ceremonies, but for not all of this was still the residue of Roman Catholicism. It wasn't reformed enough. It wasn't worship regulated by the word of God. And Knox believed that God must be worshiped only according to the way that his word has said. You cannot worship God according to how you believe, human fancy, or human traditions, what the church has generally followed. No, God must be worshiped only according to what is said in scripture. This is what we call as the doctrine of the regulative principle of worship, right? It was what Calvin and the other reformers in Geneva and the Swiss states form, and then Knox would make it integral part of his theology. However, what this meant was this put Knox's direct confrontation with his congregation. And the relationship with the pastor and his congregation deteriorated so much that certain members of the congregation plotted to reveal that Knox was there to agents of Queen Mary. That's how bad things got. The magistrates of Frankfurt, not wanting any trouble in their city, so they gave notice of this to Knox and asked him to flee. Knox was invited uh, back to Geneva by Calvin, and Calvin then said, well, if you can't be in Frankfurt, you're creating too much problems there, well, why don't you help pastor the refugees that were flooding into Geneva? Uh, because England was now undergoing this Marian persecution, the pro Protestant uh, refugees were all fleeing. And where did they go to? The free city of Geneva. And so they all fled to Geneva, and someone needs to speak English to these people, right? And so they had a pastor now, Knox. And Knox found great encouragement in Geneva. He called Geneva the most perfect school of Christ that, what, that ever was since the days of the apostles. And it was here that Knox fine-tuned his thoughts and his entire philosophy of ministry, of Christian education, of culture, of politics, which he would then later implement in Scotland. He sat basically at the feet of John Calvin and he took all that Calvinism, he drank it, and he figured out how is he going to implement that to a broader society, just as Calvin was doing in Geneva. But Geneva was one city. But now Knox is thinking big, right? He's thinking about an entire kingdom. And that's what he would eventually get to do. Knox also contributed to the translation of the Geneva Bible and many of the study notes. Um, the Geneva Bible was the first study Bible to have ever been printed. And do you know why you have the King James Version? 
is because King James I did not like the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible was the preferred translation for all the reformers, including the Puritans. The Puritans ref refused to use the King James Version. That was, it's popular because that was what was used in the Church of England, and they were mandated to do so, and it got shipped all around the world. But the Geneva Bible was what Knox was one of the commentators on it. And the reason that uh, James I did not like it was some of the comments, particularly comments that Calvin and Knox had put, uh, with regards to what authority kings derive from, where they get their authority, and what um, they should do with that authority. Anyway, going forward. Um, so over here, um, Knox is learning a lot of stuff, he's thinking through, and in 1555, the Scottish nobles back home, they pleaded for Knox to return. Um, the Scottish nobles pleaded for Knox to return. And though now, in Scotland, you have Mary Guise, and in England, you have another Mary, right? Mary I, and both are Catholic queens, right? But despite that, Knox made his way back. He preached in open defiance of the monarch, and often calling uh, Mary Jezebel and he, with such languages. And wherever he went, he was welcomed and he was heard. However, things got quite dangerous, with the Catholics burning his effigy in Edinburgh, and he was forced to return to Edinburgh, uh, forced to return to Geneva one more time. But this time, he returned with his wife, and he ministered in Geneva alongside Calvin. And it was this time he now he wrote his now infamous pamphlet against Queen Mary, uh, Queen Mary the First in England. And he wrote this uh, pamphlet that is called First Blasts of the Trumpet Against the Mos Monstrous Regiment of Women basically saying um, that in the entire pamphlet, what he would say was it was unnatural for women to be leaders and it was unnatural for women to govern, okay? Um, and this one writing has forever sullied Knox's name as a chauvinist. If you ever want to know why people say that Knox hated women, it's because of this, right? Knox could not have chosen a poorer time to publish it. Why? Because the person he intended to be on the other side was Queen Mary I, the Catholic queen. Right? But she died that very young. And her half-sister, Elizabeth, became queen. Queen Elizabeth I. And Elizabeth was very much Protestant. She very much supported the reformers. But here is a pamphlet making rounds that women should not be ruling. And when she read the pamphlet, she was displeased. For this pamphlet openly undermined her authority as a legitimate ruler. Um, she supported Knox but reluctantly. One time Knox would have to travel through um, England um, and he would ask for a passport and Queen Elizabeth would say, do not give it to that man. Um, even though she would support him at certain times, she never forgave him for this. And also Knox being Knox, he would never apologize for it. Um, in 1559, Knox finally returned to Scotland. Despite his ill health, he traveled across Scotland preaching nonstop. And this was the Reformation in Scotland. Wherever he went, he preached the gospel and the Holy Spirit brought revival. People were converted across Scotland in the thousands. Statues of saints and of Mary, which were venerated in the churches, they were all toppled. It was idolatry. The mass was replaced by a proper understanding of the sacrament and Knox restored the gospel to Scotland. The Catholic Archbishop of St. Andrews threatened Knox and he called them to stop this preaching. Knox continued to preach that 14 priests of St. Andrews under the Archbishop converted to Protestantism, and they left. The resurrection power of Jesus was evident all over Scotland, and it was all done by the preaching. Knox feared no man, even when assassins were sent after him. He said, my life is in the hand of him whose glory I seek, and thereof I fear not their threats. I desire the hand and weapon of no man to defend me. This was a man who had taken a sword to defend a preacher. Another time he said, I have never once feared the devil, but I tremble every time I enter the building. There was only one person not feared. That was his God. Such was his fearless faith. The Protestant nobles, they rallied behind Knox and they raised their armies with support from England 
which as Queen Elizabeth, who's a Protestant queen. And so the armies of the Protestant nobles in Scotland and Queen Elizabeth, they fought the armies of Queen Mary Peace and they defeated them one battle after another. Knox all the while was giving fiery sermons, exhorting the people for the cause of the gospel to stand up for the crown rights of Jesus. He would thunder from the pulpit day in and day out and said that King Jesus alone was due all allegiance. The following year, Queen Mary Guise of Scotland, she was deposed by the Protestant lords when they entered Edinburgh. And the Parliament, the Scottish Parliament was called and the members of the Parliament and the Lords of the Parliament of, of Scotland, they asked Knox to form a committee and to come up with a statement of faith, a clear statement of faith for Scotland. In just five days, Knox and his committee of theologians would come up with what is now we know as the Scots Confession. And um, it's available online, you can go read it. It's a beautiful declaration of the reformed faith. And in five days they did it. The following week, the parliament approved the confession and abolished the jurisdiction of the Pope in Scotland. The parliament outlawed the mass and all religions contrary to the reformed faith. The parliament then tasked John Knox to form a new church in Scotland, true to the gospel. And hence the Presbyterian church was formed. That's where we come from. Knox wanted everyone in Scotland to read the Bible. So, why? Because he knew the power of God's uh, word firsthand, and he knew it was only God's word that would transform people's lives and transform society. So what did he do? He set up universal education. The first nation that set up universal education, it is Scotland. We take for granted today, right? And this education was not just for boys, boys and girls. Not really a person who hates women, but that's what people say. John Calvin, during all that happened, and the, the, all this has happened in a few months, right? During all that has happened, he wrote, he wrote in a letter, we are astonished at such incredible progress in so brief of a time. So we likewise give thanks to God whose singular blessing is signally displayed here within. However, in the most fruitful season of his life, when he was enjoying all his success, and Scotland became a true Protestant kingdom under the banner of Christ. Knox experienced his deepest loss when his wife Marjorie died. His grief was immense at the loss of this woman who gave up everything to be united to him. Queen Mary Guise also died, and Queen Mary of Scots, the third Mary now, came to the throne. Knox had troubled relationships with every single Mary, but Mary of Scots is the most dramatic of that. Uh, Mary of Scots had grown up in France all her life, and she was more a French woman than either English or Scottish. She didn't want to be in Scotland, but she was made to come there because she um, was uh, engaged to the French uh, Dauphin, the French next to, uh, who would become the next king, and he died. So then she was sent to Scotland because that was her realm. Um, when she reached Edinburgh, by now we need to understand that she's a devout Catholic coming from France. But Scotland is now a Protestant kingdom. A Protestant kingdom with a Catholic queen. A Protestant kingdom where the law says you can't follow Catholic faith. You can't celebrate the mass. But you have a Catholic queen who heads your kingdom. And so the first, son, uh, the first time she reached Edinburgh, she had private mass in her bedchambers. She couldn't even do it publicly. In her bedchamber, she had that with a personal Catholic priest. Guess what Knox did? That very Sunday, the church in Edinburgh, right across, he thundered from the pulpit against the sin of celebrating the mass. And he said that such pollution must be taken away from the land. When Queen Mary supporters told Knox not to speak out against his queen, to whom he owed allegiance, he responded, that they should mind their jobs because he was only doing his job as a keeper in the house of God. Uh, he was given an audience with the queen just a few days later and Mary accused Knox of promoting revolution and for the people to go against their princess, a very serious charge, go against the princess by receiving another religion which the prince did not approve of, but the magistrate did not allow. So she asked him directly, Think ye that subjects having power may resist their princes? In other words, can people resist a monarch? Till now, 
it was unthinkable. Till now, kings and queens in Europe, they ruled by what is called the doctrine of divine right, that God had placed them there. So therefore, you were to give them absolute allegiance. They could do whatever they want, but they made the law, and they should not be resisted, but you must submit to them. But when she asked Knox that, this is what Knox replied without hesitation. If their princes exceed their bounds, madam, and go and do against that which they should be obeyed, it is no doubt that they may be resisted, even by power. Knox then launched into an impassioned speech that no more obedience was required to the magistrate than that was required to your parents. And he gave this illustration. If a parent went mad and threatened to destroy and kill their children, then it was the duty of the children to ensure that they rise up and bind the parent who has now gone mad. And likewise, he, sa he said that if magistrates would rise up and threaten to kill their subjects by prohibiting the true gospel in the kingdom, then it was the right of the people to rise up and resist such uh, magistrates, such monarchs. And so he said, resistant to tyranny was not only a right of the people, but it was a duty. And this is where the famous phrase comes. Resistant to tyranny is obedience to God. Imagine that scene, this frail man with his huge beard, grieving the death of his wife, standing before this young queen and all her courtiers, and he's admonishing her that if she stepped out of line from what God's word said, then the people of Scotland had every right to do away with her. The queen hearing this went absolutely white. No one had ever dared to speak to her that way. She had the power to have Knox killed right then and there. And yet Knox had the courage to speak the truth. And I hope you've seen how revolutionary this is, right? Because what Knox is laying down are the political foundations that kings and queens are not absolute, that everyone is subject to the rule of law. It is not the king who is above the law, but everyone is, including the king. And this thought is a foundation of modern democracy. It's a Presbyterian ideal. This is why uh, in the American War of Independence, when the American colonies, the 13 colonies got freedom from England, um, do you know what they called uh, that war in England? In England, the war was called, the Revolutionary War was how we get to know it, but they called it the Presbyterian War because it was the doctrines of Knox that they said that was causing this. And uh, modern political rights that we know today, our modern understanding of democracy, it all comes from this, right? Knox was way ahead of his time, centuries ahead. Um, if you guys know a man named Vishal Mangalwadi, um, he did, uh, I think about a year ago, there's an um, interview that he did with Tom Holland. Uh, Tom Holland is a secular historian, and he wrote this book called Dominion, um, How Christianity Made the Western World. And in that, he basically traces that, oh, you've been taught wrong. He says that you think democracy comes from the Greeks. No, 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 no. It comes from the Presbyterians. It comes from Knox and his followers. On another occasion, Knox confronted a young queen who was to marry a Catholic man for her husband. She was furious and demanded of Knox, what have you to do with my marriage? That was all Knox needed. He began a long sermon telling why he had the right to confront her and why she should not do what she did. Unable to control herself, the queen burst into tears. These incidents today are portrayed by feminists to be in actions of a chauvinist. But Knox deeply carried, uh, cared for Mary's soul. And he only did what he thought was right as a, a preacher of God's word. Knox truly believed himself to be a minister of the gospel, which meant that he had to confront sin with the law of God. He saw himself as a prophet of the Old Testament who had to confront sin and bring forth repentance. Mary disliked Knox very much, as you can imagine, but she never dared harm him. She respected him too much. She once said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than all the assembled armies of Europe. Imagine a monarch saying that. 
Lot was a man of deep prayer, and it was from this that he got his strength to preach fearlessly the truth of God without care or consequence. In 1572, 12 years after the Reformation began and was brought to Scotland, Knox preached his final sermon. His final sermon, he had to be carried to the pulpit. That's how weak he was. And when, but once he was hoisted into the pulpit, Knox leaned over the pulpit, and if you've seen those paintings, you'll know. And he started thundering, as he always did, the thundering Scott. And then once he was done, he was this frail self again, and he had to be carried out to his bedroom. On November 24, 1572, he told his second wife uh, he had remarried, uh, Margaret Stewart, to read from John 17, the high priestly prayer, where he first cast his anchor in Christ. And then he asked her to read some of his friend John Calvin's sermons on Ephesians. See, Ephesians meant a lot to a lot of people. Come on Sundays, we, <laughs> we're doing a sermon series on Ephesians. He then died in the Lord, aged 58. The Earl of Mont Morton said at his death, Here lies one who in his life never feared the face of man. Not life and legacy attest what great things God can do to weak men. So yeah, so that's the life of John Knox and what he did. And I hope that was informative and perhaps even inspirational. Um, and if you want to read more, there are a couple of books I would recommend. One is Jane Dawson's John Knox, which is about 370 pages. Um, I read that this week, uh, the entire book, and it is an amazing book. Uh, you get to hear about uh, letters that he wrote to Elizabeth uh, Bowes, um, uh, Marjorie's sister and all, and those are beautiful letters. Um, but a more accessible one, which I would recommend if you just want to get started, is by Douglas Bond, The Mighty Weakness of John Knox. Uh, that's printed by Reformation Trust, and I think Rowan has that book he showed me the other day. So that's a beautiful book, um, and I would recommend you to get that. But let's uh, close our time, and we'll have a few question and answers, but let's close our time with a prayer. Um, and let's actually, uh, um, this is actually a book where the prayers of John Knox. And um, um, I'll read this prayer that he actually said at his deathbed, which is a beautiful prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, sweet Jesus, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Look propitiously, O Lord, on thy church that thou hast redeemed. Restore peace to this afflicted commonwealth. Raise up faithful pastors who shall take care of thy church. Grant, O Lord, that we may be incited by the examples of thy anger and by a sense of thy mercy to detest sin and to serve thee from the heart. Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thou knowest, O Lord, my pains. I do not murmur to thee. Nay, O Lord, if it seems good to thee, I am not reluctant to bear for many years those troubles and griefs that in thy just, thy just judgments thou hast laid on me. Do thou only continue to shine on my mind through Jesus Christ. Amen. And that was his final prayer. And how beautiful it is, right? Even there he's saying, Lord, if it's your will that I should continue to suffer in my weakness, then may it be. And I hope that gives you an insight of what kind of man this is. And this is also a really good book uh, printed by Reformation Heritage. Uh, if you can get it, it's great. And Knox's prayers, unlike Cranmer's prayers and all, are not small pity prayers. They go for pages. <laughs> so that was the manuals. Okay, um, any questions, comments on that?